But I am Virginia Burns, and I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, this is the first of a, what we have to be a three-part series to help educate um, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and the greater research community here at Duke um, on translational research and kind of the hurdles that you have to overcome in order to translate those wonderful basic science discoveries that you have in the lab into real clinical outcomes. So Dr. Caleb is going to be our first speaker here today, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him in a second. Um, I'd like to quickly go ahead and thank Molly Starbuck from the um, Postdoctoral Affairs Office and Christy Ahn, who works with faculty in Richmond. Um, they have been integral and very um, spearheaded this effort to put together this series. Um, I do um, Dr. Caleb is uh, Vice Chancellor for Clinical Research here at Duke University. He is also the um, PI and the director of the Duke Translational Medicine Institute. Um, he's a uh, professor in, in the Department of Medicine Divis Division of Cardiology. And um, before he came on board and was spearheaded the, the effort to really develop DTMI or the Duke Translational Medical Institute, he um, started the Duke, Clin Tran oh, sorry, Duke Clinical Research Institute, DCRI which has had a great pack both here at impact both here at Duke and globally. So I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about that and uh, hope you enjoy. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Virginia. It's a privilege to uh, be here. And what I'm going to try to do is give you um, a picture of where translational research is headed. And then it sounds like in the next two sessions, you'll get into more nuts and bolts practical information. Before I do that, though, let me just get a sense of uh, what the audience is. Um, how many of you are actually postdocs? Okay. And how many of you are postdocs in what you would call the basic sciences? Are any here postdocs in what you would call the clinical sciences? No. So, all right, a few. Okay, good. So it's a, it's a mixed audience. I see some people that look a little old to be postdocs and actually recognize who you are, so um, I'm glad you're here too. And uh, my goal is to get through this and give you a broad picture and then uh, have plenty of time for uh, Q&A, which I think may be the most important part. But this first slide really, um, in a, in a uh, picture, uh, gives the motivation for why there's such a focus on translation now. This came from a talk that um, a close colleague, Barry Kohler, and I were asked to give uh, to the American Association of Professors, which is this uh, honorary um, society of uh, professors in medicine that mostly deals with uh, T1 translation as its focus. Barry and I have worked together on several um, stem to stern translational efforts from development of uh, a biological target to uh, getting on the market uh, with a product. And I'll, a lot of what I say today actually will have to do with uh, ideas and concepts that we've uh, developed together, coming from very different backgrounds. Uh, although uh, he's a physician investigator, his focus has really been on the biology of uh, on the level, whereas I come from the opposite side of having worked in uh, clinical populations for my career and often taking the handoff from more fundamental scientists uh, trying to develop those concepts into useful approaches to diagnosis and treatment. I also want to thank some other people who have contributed much to these ideas. Bruce Sollinger, who I don't think is here today, who is the head of the Translational Research Institute, which as I'll show you is our institutional entity to try to help make this happen. Vicki Christian, who's in the um, audience and has played a major role as chief operating officer of that organization, and also Sally Cornbluth, who I think you all know, who's been a great collaborator, spice team uh, for research. Um, so this is sort of the bottom line uh, for what I think you should be thinking about, and I'm going to try to justify these points uh, with the rest of the talk. Uh, a PhD in the biomedical sciences uh, does open a lot of potential careers, and I think uh, those careers uh, will be critical to fuel the translational engine. And so there are many different jobs that can arise from a PhD in the biomedical sciences. But the second point I think is also really important as you think about how you spend your time preparing for the future, and that is that only a small fraction of people with a PhD 
uh, in the biomedical sciences will uh, compete effectively as independent laboratory. The number that I'm science. currently hearing, although I can't find this exactly published anywhere, is about 5% would be a good estimate. Uh, everybody else will be working somewhere in the system to contribute uh, in many different ways. But, for example, the Lefkowitzes of the world um, are going to be few and far between. As I'm going to show you, given the way funding is headed, uh, the concept of an individual running a laboratory um, is something that will continue to be highly prized, but it's really on, only for a select few who have a particular set of skills and capabilities. However, the good news is that for everybody else, uh, there are going to be plenty of jobs and they're going to uh, involve a lot of different things, including laboratory and project management, team science, regulatory science, uh, clinical research, uh, forming a bridge between uh, biological knowledge and uh, human outcomes. And I would particularly emphasize, uh, for those of you who are young enough to still think about it, informatics and quantitative disciplines. I think this is where most of the field is headed, and many people are saying that um, biology is stuck um, somewhere in the distant past in terms of how it deals with quantitative issues. And this is really just to get, I'll give a few anecdotes throughout this, but the real wake up call for me about this was when the NIH was developing its roadmap about a decade ago. There were a number of focus groups of people who had large grants from the NIH, and I was privileged to go to a number of those focus groups. And there's a woman named Shirley Jackson who is the um, president of RPI, and she's a fairly well-known uh, physics professor by trade. And sort of at the end of a meeting, she said, you know, as I'm reflecting on this, you all in the biological sciences are where we were in physics at the turn of the last century. She was referring to 1900. And her point was that you operate as independent silos with very little rapid transmission of information, your research results are copyrighted by people uh, um, and held back from being published for a long period of time. In physics, she said, uh, we have large resources, we share those resources. When we have a finding, it's posted on the internet and people um, have a battle over what the truth is related to that finding and knowledge evolves at a more rapid pace. Now, whether she's right or not, I think that gives you something to think about as to where at least some people think uh, this is all headed. And then I would argue we're trying to create a model at Duke to provide um, people like you with access to these opportunities. But of course it's done in the context of a traditional structure which has been uh, sort of um, ossified over time and it's been highly productive and useful. And so uh, making this transition is not an easy thing and there are multiple cultures that have to come together to make this work. So why are people so concerned about uh, translation? This is a slide I almost always show now when I give a talk because sometimes people take my message as being pessimistic. It's not really <laughs> pessimistic. I, for whatever reason, I come from a background where when things are going well, I'm not very interested. And uh, <laughs> if there's a problem, I'm driven to try to solve the problem. So I do want to say that you know there's good news. We've seen a steady reduction in uh, people's risk of being dead if they're born in the United States since 1900. You'll note the one exception to this is the uh, influenza pandemic of 1918. But even in times of World War, it's kind of interesting that we've seen the steady decline uh, in risk of death. And before uh, 1950, this was almost all due to things other than medical care. After 1950, we really do now have a major influence directly of the biomedical uh, research enterprise in a very direct way. But there's also bad news, and this is what's driving uh, things. If we put the U.S. on the scale, almost no one is arguing that at least right now, we are the world leaders in terms of biomedical science. And yet when we look at the application of that science in practice, we're lagging far behind. Currently, we're ranked 37th in the world uh, in terms of ranking of countries in terms of health outcomes. And I like to show this slide because it comes from our business school. And the main point of the slide is that if you are purchasing uh, good health, the United States is about the last place in the world you would go. <laughs> because not only do we have bad outcomes, but we do it at a much higher price. This is sort of like buying a product that's guaranteed to be defective, but you're paying three times as much for it. And uh, th this is very clear data. Uh, people who study this are not arguing about it much. We simply have a problem between our prowess in biomedical research and the capability of delivering uh, good health to our country. 
And uh, people are waking up to this. And this is also an old slide from our business school that was made at a time when uh, we were trying to inform uh, students and people thinking about the future that consumerism was here to stay and that there were multiple factors that were converging to cause this consumerist movement led by the United States but really taking place around the world. None of these factors have led up. The prediction, I think, has proved to be true, but the new form of this consumerism is in the form of voluntary health organizations. We used to call these patient advocacy groups. And what they're almost to a group now saying is that we are tired of giving money to universities and paying these large overheads and getting nothing in return. And we especially don't want to give money to universities um, and have them say, we'll do some great basic science, don't worry, eventually this will all work out, you can count on us curing your disease at some point in the future. What they want is deliverable-based research uh, done with a focus on translating knowledge into better human health. Now, how bad is it at the level of uh, developing new therapies? And this surprises people when they first see it, but this is from an article that came out in Science not too long ago. And I will proudly say that um, if you look uh, second to the bottom there, Ipsiximab, this is a drug that Barry Kohler invented and we developed at the DCRI. As a little side story about the role of Duke and all this when we're really creative, um, and Sixamab is a drug which blocks the ability of platelets to aggregate. And it was considered extra extraordinarily risky uh, when it was developed because in early animal models, the animal simply bled to death. And so people said, we can't do even the first human experiment. Barry, to his credit, literally did what's called a neomort study. He got consent from people who were going to die and who had agreed to not be resuscitated. And when they died, instead of running in and resuscitating them, they gave them a shot of abciximab and measured what happened. That opened it up and enabled us to then lead the um, outcome-based clinical trials. But it turned out in the middle of the phase three trial, the company that was developing abciximab, Senecor, had sort of a disaster with another product they had developed, and they became bankrupt immediately. Duke University actually loaned Senecor multiple millions of dollars to get this trial done until they could get co-funding from Eli Lilly, which led to the completion of the trial and the shortest period of time of any uh, product from concept to definitive clinical trial is actually the work that we did together. Now, the only problem with this story is that was over a decade ago. We haven't been able to replicate it since, so it's not that we actually had special knowledge. It was probably that we were foolish enough and inexperienced enough that we just did it and didn't ask all the questions that people are asking now that tend to hold us back from making progress. But you'll notice the time frames we're talking about here are on the order of decades. And our, our chancellor, Victor Zao, has been very interested in this because he was involved in the very early work with the renin-angiotensin system and the biology of that system. And if you look at the point from discovery of how that system worked, to the first ACE inhibitor, the first drug designed to block that system, it was 25 years. So what we're hearing from society and from uh, voluntary health organizations is, what are you guys doing? We're paying all this money, you got these huge buildings, all these scientists, it's taking you 25 years to go from discovering something to developing something that will give us a cure. Most of us don't have 25 years to wait. So you'd better clean up your act and uh, focus more on translation. So a lot of us have been looking at this and thinking about it, and as we look at it, there are really, um, on a broad sense, two big blocks that we have. And this uh, work came through uh, a, a group that was put together on a national basis to look at it in multiple publications about it. But basically, we have this great scientific machine, and just getting from that scientific machine to the first human study seems to be an almost unbelievable block, and it's so bad it's now called the Valley of Death, which is where that slide uh, comes from. Out of every compound that actually becomes a molecular entity, over 99% <coughs> fail before they get to the point of being on the market, and once drugs get on the market, as you hear in the news every day, over half turn out to have major safety problems that were not discovered before the drug was widely promulgated and prescribed. So these are significant problems. The second block, which I'm not going to focus on today, but would be very relevant to postdocs in the clinical sciences, is that even after we've done the definitive clinical trials and we know a treatment is effective, it still takes many years 
to have that uh, finding and knowledge um, uh, put into practice. And uh, some people here in the audience are working diligently on this issue, but uh, just like the first block, we can't really say we solved the problem at this point. So uh, it turned out um, I'm an avid golfer, and we have a group that meets in a different place every year and plays, and we played um, um, out uh, in Western Canada uh, three years ago. And it turned out I drove down this road about an hour before this happened. And so I ended up getting some pictures of what I would have looked like had I been an hour later coming through the um, pass in British Columbia. But um, this is definitely a translational block that's occurring, getting one place to another. And this is what you all, I think, need to be focused on in your careers if you want to um, help move scientific findings into human application. So we looked at this seven or eight years ago when Sandy Williams was dean, spent a lot of time thinking about it. And if you look at the system the way it currently uh, works or doesn't work, it's actually astoundingly disorganized and impossible to really explain. We have this basic discovery uh, system that you all know about, and then we start uh, translating into early studies in the pre-human space. Industry and biotech tends to do that. We won't talk today about how you get funding from those entities these days. And then uh, we do early human studies, and we have these new entities called CROs, or clinical research organizations, which are increasingly piping the research out of the United States into other countries where it can be done less expensively. And academic centers get re-involved at that point often in doing some of the clinical trials, but not the majority of the clinical trials that are done. And then uh, we find that something may actually work, and we have to implement it involving hospitals, practices, academic health systems, et cetera. It's pretty hard to understand. And then eventually, the ultimate goal, of course, would be to have therapies employed globally for the public health. That happens many years later involving a variety of different kinds of organizations that are also hard to explain. So if you look societally and you ask the question, um, what's the one kind of entity that touches every element of this disorganized system? It's actually the academic um, health system. And, but the timeline, as I've said, is 15 to 20 years. So if we're going to approach this problem, how do we need to think differently than the way we thought typically in biomedical sciences? And this is from uh, the talk that Barry and I gave and wrote an article about it that you can find in the uh, journal uh, Science uh, Translational Medicine. Um, it goes through in some detail at least the way we would look at what a successful translational team would look like. But there are some ways that uh, it's pretty clear this is uh, different. I think most of us would agree that when it comes to discovery science, it should not be oriented towards a particular goal. It should be free, um, driven by curiosity, and follow the trail of discovery. Um, the next logical step would be what you learned in the, in the previous step and where you need to go is the next logical step. Whereas translational research starts with an identified health need and tries to find something which will take care of that health need and it always keeps the final goal in mind, which is turning out to be a critical issue in this whole system. So um, you could define translational research then as the application of the scientific method to address a health need. That is fundamentally different than the way we think about, and should, I argue, think about discovery science, which is discovery science is whatever a uh, curious person can think about and convince others in a peer review system would be worth learning about. So why is this so difficult? And the reason is because for it to work, it requires an alignment of vastly different incentives and cultures across at least three dimensions, and these were the three that we identified. Um, you've got to have multidisciplinary team building, integration across the entire T1 to T2 spectrum, and integration of the academic discipline with government agencies, industry, philanthropy, and patient advocacy groups. This is a tall order and sort of boggles the mind of the average person, understandably, but I think what we've learned is that if we approach this as a totally disaggregated set of things that people do with their heads down. What we end up with is a lot of new knowledge, but very little ability to improve human health. And more and more people are thinking this way, as I'll show you at the end, including our Congress and the National Institutes of Health. So um, we would argue that in order to have an effective translational team, you need people who can span the spectrum 
starting with the ability to articulate a health need with the precision of a basic science hypothesis. Not a simple thing to do. And the ability to create a robust and practical assay to begin to address that health need. Now, these assays can be in multiple different forms depending on the type of science that you're doing. And one that people used to never think about, but that we think is critical, as you start a translational project, you should at least be able to visualize what a phase three clinical trial would look like. And for those of you who don't think about this, essentially what phase three means is a definitive study that if it were positive would lead to um, approval by an agency like the FDA that this is something that should be applied to human beings. This is a tough hurdle. But unless you have that in mind, as we look historically at this enormous failure rate, I mean, if you think about it, who would invest in a business where the failure rate is 99.8%? We're talking to pharmaceutical companies that say we would like to double our success rate so we only fail 99.6% of the time when we start a project. And so uh, this is a tall hurdle, but um, many, many of the failures are because people pursue translation with no end in mind and they end up at the end of the road with no ability to fund the project or get it to a place where it really could be applied. Uh, to improve human health. So what is the NIH's response to this? And when the NIH began to look at this under the leadership of Elias Sirhuni, I concluded that our academic uh, health centers were part of the problem because they reflected the disorganization that I've shown you already. And there was a need to create um, a more organized um, cooperative system in academic health centers. And this became the CTSA organization. I'm a little nervous today. We just finished uh, four years of our CTSA, and our application for competitive renewal is being reviewed today. So this will, and we were in the first round, so we are the first institution to go through a competitive renewal on this uh, very large national project. But you notice the concept here is pulling together all these disparate elements that in the past have existed independently and have not been pulled together. And even saying that this is not something the government should do alone, but it needs to be done in partnership with industry and with healthcare delivery organizations. And so uh, the impetus then comes from this, you know, seeing societal need uh, to catalyze change and lower the barriers that exist between the disciplines that I'm sure in your everyday lives you feel as you go into your laboratories and work. And to overcome these barriers, we've got to encourage uh, people uh, young enough to do it like you, to be creative in how you think about this and to challenge the status quo. That's really, in large part, what we're asking for. In your everyday lives, you feel as you go into your laboratories and work. And to overcome these barriers, we've got to encourage uh, people uh, young enough to do it like you, to be creative in how you think about this and to challenge the status quo. That's really, in large part, what we're asking for. So you notice the philosophies here are sort of the opposite of what used to get you tenure. <laughs> Getting tenure was the uh, rugged individual who um, claimed total credit. I mean, how many times have I reviewed now um, competitions where the line starts off, my discoveries were X, Y, and Z, and the whole contest is over whether you independently thought of that idea. Our view of translation is that that never happens. Discovery science may happen that way, I think increasingly less so as we get better connected using uh, better information technologies. But clinical advances happen through people thinking together and cooperating and collaborating. And we've got to figure out how to reward that uh, in a complex system like ours. This program now includes 56 members, you'll notice almost every state is represented in North Carolina, it's Duke and UNC. Um, there, there's a little bit of a gap there in the West, but don't worry about the West. I, I've uh, learned a lot about the politics of how this all works, and there's a reason that five states love to be part of the University of Washington. It's called 10 senators. So <laughs> if you want clout in terms of funding allocation, uh, get a bunch of senators together and form a block that can basically stop anybody else if they don't agree to go along with it. But um, essentially, if you thought about each state with um, its uh, academic health systems that are majority funded by the NIH, uh, this would be the CTSA organization. And you notice again these terms, working together as a national consortium. This is a dream which is not uh, obviously not yet fulfilled. It's very much work in progress. 
These are our five major strategic um, goals. And you'll notice number two there um, is something that we're really in the middle of now is beginning to define the competencies of people who could function in a translational organization. And it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that the competencies look a bit different than what you would have if you were training someone to be an independent investigator running a laboratory. Um, I would encourage you to go to the CTSA website, ctsaweb.org. There's a, so much stuff on there. Those of us involved in it can't keep up with it. But as you're thinking about careers and things that you might do in other institutions that have large biomedical research complexes, you'll have access to essentially 90% of uh, NIH-funded um, organizations through this website and what they're doing in translational medicine. So as we tried to absorb all this uh, new thinking, uh, we thought, how can we apply this to our own situation here at Duke? And the first point I want to make is that if you look at what's happened to academic health centers, um, if you went back 20 years ago, we were known as the Ivory Towers, right? An academic health center, for the most part, would be a big hospital that does tertiary and quaternary care, and then uh, a set of buildings that do research in the School of Medicine. But what's happened now is that with consolidation of healthcare delivery, if you look at a place like Duke, we are now a huge integrated health system with 30,000 employees that does everything from nursing homes to primary care to uh, tertiary quaternary care here at Duke Hospital and includes community hospitals and multiple practices off site. And so we can no longer say, as we used to say, we're just um, academic health centers, we're the ivory tower, all that translation stuff, that's somebody else's problem. The poor health in the United States, that's not our problem. We just train doctors and other types of scientists, so it's not our issue. It definitely is our issue, and increasing numbers of people in society are recognizing that. So as we look at this conglomeration that I've already shown you, we tried to build something that would tie together relationships, not to own any part of this, because no single institution can or should, or even within any element of it, own the entire thing. But the goal is to begin to create um, relationships and communication systems that enable people in any part of this continuum to be able to cross the barriers that exist either within the institution or between the institution and all these outside entities that we must interact with uh, to lead to greater success. And actually, um, today is a, is a pretty uh, fun day for me. I'm headed to Brazil tonight where there's a thing called the Brazilian Clinical Research Institute, funded by the Brazilian government, which is a replica of our Clinical Research Institute, built on the same principles. And I hope that rather than taking 10 years to get to the point that we go beyond clinical research into broader translation, that in Brazil, we can accelerate that um, approach so that um, we begin to tie these things together uh, much more quickly. So, Another way of looking at this, the original CTSA RFA said, we need you to create a home for clinical and translational research on campus. And that's what we've been trying to do. Our mantra really is a picture of a home that's sandwiched between um, this huge discovery science enterprise that we have on campus. And on the other end, the Global Health Institute, which is obviously much smaller and new, but if you look at its reach, it's really, I would say, been the most successful new program at the institution that I've seen. I can say that with a little authority. I came here in 1969. So I've seen a lot of the history um, of the university. And if you look at what we're doing now, we're working in over 80 countries in one way or another. We very much are um, a global university with uh, a broad reach. It may not feel that day in everyday work, and our goal is to change the way it feels so that more people are involved. Now let's look quickly at what's, uh, what, what the, the goal is. So, House within the Translational Medicine Institute, we have five pillars. And if you start at the left, this would be the bench to bedside component that you're going to discuss in a lot more detail in the next two talks, uh, DTRI. This is uh, headed by Bruce Sollinger, who's a great representative, I think, of someone who came here as a PhD from Tom Chuck's lab, is in the Department of Surgery, um, has a large number of um, doctoral and postdoctoral students, has invented uh, several uh, drugs, which are now uh, in late stage development, and a number of new companies that are developing um, early stage products. And uh, Vicki, with a uh, history in academia, but also uh, in the industry, I think is a great COO for that organization. 
We've also revamped our first in human studies. I prefer to call it human challenge studies now because one of our major projects, for example, is uh, beginning to understand how aspirin works. Now, you, you might uh, say this is a paradigm for how many problems we have in translation. Aspirin has been on the market for 100 years. It was only uh, 20 years ago that the label was removed that said it's contraindicated in people with heart disease because we suddenly realized it actually prevented vascular disease. Um, and still today, we have no idea what the right dose is. And I've asked people all over the world to raise their hand if they can name and defend the right dose of aspirin. No one has yet taken me up on the challenge. So we're doing intensive studies of gene expression uh, and genomic analyses of volunteers being given different doses of aspirin to try to understand better how it actually works. So this is not just about early phase compounds, it's about later phase compounds. Another example I'll just mention to you is in the field of pediatrics, uh, how many of you are parents? How many of you think we have any earthly idea of the right dose of the average drug that your pediatrician prescribes? Obviously that's a leading question. Uh, if you had said yes, I, could, I think I could uh, easily show that you were wrong. Uh, Danny Benjamin here just received a $95 million contract to um, help operationalize a congressional law that basically said we have so many drugs that are now off patent for which we don't know the right dose that are in common use in pediatrics that we need the NIH to actually go back and do drug development on drugs that are already generic and are commonly used in practice in children. And so far, almost everything that's been looked at, we've been, had a surprise about what the right dose would be. It is true that children are not just small adults. And so if you want to take an area where um, developmental biology, an understanding of systems biology, an understanding of gene expression and how it may change over time, uh, this would be it. And we also just received a training grant to focus on the maternal um, uh, um, child uh, pair before birth. And if you want to talk about an area where we need places like Duke to step up, as you know, the risk has been so high of doing studies in this area that companies develop drugs and they write contraindicated in pregnant women. But we have a large and growing number of pregnant women who have serious diseases where they have to take the drugs, and yet we know nothing about what the effects of the drugs are. So another area where a merger of uh, scientific expertise and human studies in a very high risk situation with a lot of sake for uh, people can play out. One in the middle is the DCRI. I won't talk about that because it's been here a long time, but um, you can get a little bit of the history of the DCRI. I just uh, was walking by with Dr. Harrington, the current director. If you go to Duke North and just walk down the hallway beyond the cafeteria, there's a display about the history of the DCRI, which tells the story and I think looks pretty nice. We now have a translational nursing Institute, which is uh, focused on implementation of what we know. And so the question here is, let's say we have a treatment that's known to be effective, how do you actually get it used in a clinic in an appropriate fashion or in a hospital unit? And uh, people at first are sort of shocked to hear that that's an issue, but um, it's a huge issue and explains a lot of why health in the United States is not what it should be. And then on the far end, we have a community uh, research group, which has gained a lot of national uh, renown uh, because of our Durham County um, effort, the Durham Health Innovations Project. And we're about to start the implementation phase of that. We spent several years um, in intense focus groups coming up with a plan to change the way we deliver health care in Durham County. Uh, believe it or not, uh, we, re we had almost complete consensus on what the new system should look like. I won't have time to go over that today, and it's a little far removed from the T1 arena, but something uh, that you should be aware of. And then critically, you'll notice these cross-cutting structures. My dad uh, was an architect, and so I learned that you can build a nice looking building on the outside, but if you don't have the structures that hold it up, uh, it's going to collapse. And um, these are areas which traditionally have been undervalued in academia, except the one called education, which is what you're all beneficiaries of. <laughs> Um, but if you look at a lot of these other areas, um, they have not been the major focus of academic institutions. And I've already told you, if I had a kid now that was going into biomedical sciences, I'd say get cross-trained in either informatics or statistics. Along with your biological science, you'll be, um, of, you'll be priceless in the market. And the reason for that is because everybody's going to want your skills um, if you're good at the combination of those two things.
But you also notice things like regulatory affairs and project leadership. Project leadership in the past has been sort of antithetical to the way academic institutions thought. Um, as I'll show you, it is going to be in at the NIH, and it's going to be a major part of the way uh, things are run. So just a couple of quick slides on that first uh, DTRI, and you'll get more about this um, in, in the next two talks. But one of the key issues at an institution like this is how do we create large technologies that everybody can use? One of the things that come out of the focus groups 10 years ago was the feeling, even back then, that if you had to build your own laboratory and through your own grants, buy technology that would fuel your research on your own, it was becoming impossible to do. And so what we need are shared technology hubs that multiple investigators can use uh, that make them uh, leaders uh, because they have access to the latest tools for their disciplines. And uh, Vicki and her team have been working uh, very hard on this with a lot of help from Sally Kornbluth, and I think we're very much in cahoots on this. And the concept would be that uh, we evaluate the need, we develop the resource, and the goal, of course, is at the end of development, once it's a mature resource, to make it a shared resource which is self-sustaining, not something into which we need to pump uh, a startup money. And th this is not fundamentally different than the way you think about any business or um, in an un unarticulated way, the way the best academic health systems have thought about the way they would fund uh, core resources. But I can tell you from several national meetings we've had, um, it's actually a lot more difficult in academic centers to do this than you might expect. Another way of asking the question is, how many centers have actually closed down a shared resource when it was no longer useful or wasn't being run effectively? And the answer is, it doesn't happen very often. Occasionally, one can tell a story about it happening. The history has been mostly that people develop uh, a technology resource because it's their area of science. They then own it, and they own the gate to using it, which is, for the most part, not the way to build a community um, of investigators. We've also focused on pilot projects, and the goal, it's one of the amazing things about academia, and I think all the CTSAs have found this out. If you put a little bit of money out there, it's amazing um, how people respond. And what we've tried to do is to say, we'd like most of our pilot money to go for some combination of a discovery scientist and a clinical researcher working together on a project with a defined goal. This has been highly successful. It's the most popular part of all of the CTSA uh, programs, and we've had some amazing successes. Just an uh, anecdote here um, about how the world works, and this should be no surprise to you. No matter how good you make a system, it's still going to be the most um, aggressive, most effective people who make best use of the system. So when we put out our initial RFA, uh, the first application we got was from this young investigator named Bob Lefkowitz, who was, seemed to be too poor to generate his own money to, uh, to do his developmental project, which was developing the chemistry um, on uh, this new pathway that he had uh, developed. We gave him something like 100000 bucks. He obviously didn't need any of it. He's now got a company which is off and running and in clinical trials already at this point. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide just to make the point that informatics is a huge focus of what we're doing. I don't think any of us really understand anywhere exactly what to do with informatics. It's such a, a large and ever-present issue. We all know it's critical. To a lot of administrators, it seems like, well, you know, it's, you know, desktop support. But uh, as all of you know, that's not what informatics is. And uh, we've got to develop more people who can understand how to develop systematic approaches to sharing information in a way where when different people look at the information, they're coming away with a common understanding of what they're looking at. And uh, as we're moving the research arena to a global basis, this is obviously becoming even more important because advances are occurring in any place at any point in time. If you're going to be at the top of your field, it may be defined more by how well you can access current knowledge in a variety of places as much as what you do specifically in your own lab. And then uh, methodologies, uh, these new areas, and these are some of the areas that we're focused on. I won't dwell on any of them, but I'm sure other, uh, others will arise over the next several years that we'll want to invest in. And the goal is to always have a pool of resources that we can invest when a new area crops up so that our scientists can have access to the best technology. Now, just one uh, quick story about uh, the way one of these areas is playing out um, and very translational in nature. 
as we were focused initially, particularly on genomic uh, medicine, uh, a donor uh, came up, David Murdoch, who basically said, I want to use my money in, the, in Kannapolis, North Carolina. I don't want any of my money going to Duke University specifically. And he said, what he said was, you guys are already wealthy. You don't need my money. I'm committed to Kannapolis, North Carolina. And so uh, Vicki and uh, others came up with the idea of, well, um, we have a lot of expertise in genomics, and we know a lot about clinical research. Let's do a molecular epidemiology study in Kannapolis. And this is the Murdoch study, which is now very much in motion with over 4,500 uh, residents of Cabarrus County and Kannapolis um, already enrolled. And uh, a number of studies already done where we had one of our typical competitions. What we said was, if you have a patient population where you have samples that you have in storage and you have clinical outcome data already collected, but you haven't had the money to apply the new scientific technologies, uh, bring forth your ideas, we'll have a competition, and we'll uh, give you some money. And we had an overwhelming number of people who had been hoarding samples and data, but had no way to pay for the use of the technology. We've had a number of publications and patent applications and patents. And a critical part of this, I see Rose Ritz sitting down here, but this intersection between this first stage of translation and uh, technology um, development and our relationships with companies is absolutely critical. One piece of advice in addition to informatics, if you're going to play in the translational space, you would be wise to visit Rose's office, get to know the people who are there. Even if you're not going to use the office in the current state of your uh, training or education, so that you understand what it takes if you have a discovery to go from an idea into something that can be patentable. We're now, of course, in a very different phase in the study where we're getting multiple um, questions from people about how can they collaborate with the study, including what we're calling meta-epidemiology, where you combine epidemiologic cohorts from different places. My favorite one right now is Calcutta, where we're about to initiate a very similar study uh, in Calcutta, where, as you know, there are uh, tens of thousands of people who are emerging from poverty into uh, middle class status with a diet um, which makes McDonald's happy but may not be very good for the health of the population. So studying why people in India get so much metabolic disease and atherosclerosis will be a focus of that study. So you'll notice the progression here. There are arrows everywhere in what we do because we're not interested in stagnation. We're interested in moving from one place to another. Also, I won't dwell on this slide, but the point, I think, of a lot of this is that um, it's good to be grounded in a discipline and to be focused on something at a stage in your career, but you would be well advised to gain the skills that it takes to move across these disciplines in case you do find something that's useful so that it can be applied in the context of all the other gains in knowledge that are occurring about human biology. So we really do believe, and this is a slide from five years ago, um, at the time, we said in 20 years, everyone in economically developed countries will have an electronic health record, biological samples, digitized image, and healthcare will be personalized. Health of the community will now be monitored using aggregate rec records instead of what we used to do. Or in PowerPoint presentation, it looks something like this. People who look the same on the outside are actually going to respond differently to different environmental and interventional influences as we try to prevent and treat disease. And I used to say this will never work in chronic diseases like diabetes, but I now am converted. But it's going to be a long road because most of what we think we're discovering is turning out to be a false positive in this field. And the reason is because it's so complicated. Every biological system seems to be related to every other biological system. And it's only when we can interdigitate these different um, arenas using informatics that we're going to really be able to make the progress that we need to make. Then, then just uh, one more quick word about the other phases of translation. In case you weren't already overwhelmed, the public health community got a little upset at the idea that there were only two translational blocks because uh, throughout the history of medicine, there's been a d debate about medical care versus public health. Medical care is something that occurs between an individual and a health care provider. Public health is based on um, aggregate assessments of the population done periodically and strategies often that don't involve medical care at all. But as we move into this electronic health record era, uh, the two are coming together. And so we're now talking about at least four translational blocks and in two arenas, the medical care system and the public health system. 
And for those of you who get interested in the application of biology in the more public health arena, this is probably, I predict, going to be the fastest growing area of jobs over the next 10 to 20 years, is understanding medical information and data applied to individuals and populations using electronic records. Um, the point of this last arrow is we're, uh, if you say, what are we missing in terms of information, the answer is almost everything. In my own field of cardiology, no one has yet disputed my, another assertion I make, which is that we have more evidence in cardiology than any other field of medicine. We just did a study. If you ask in our clinical practice guidelines when we recommend a treatment, what percentage of the time is it based on solid evidence? The answer is about 15% of the time. The other 85% is a flying guess made by experts, who about half the time are wrong, but we don't know which half. And so in this whole uh, arena of application of health, there are going to be many jobs and opportunities. So now I'm going to close with slides that we uh, had last week in a discussion with Francis Collins about where the NIH is headed. And I'm just going to show his slides and make a few comments about them, because I think they tell the story pretty well. You'll notice here that um, he stresses fundamental knowledge, which is uh, where we've been for the most part with the NIH. And then he says, uh, absolutely critical that we now apply that knowledge to improve human health. It's a mandate that's coming down and something that we should take serious. Then he refers to an article that you all should read, Opportunities for Research in the NIH, which goes through the short story in a very readable fashion. And I think as you're thinking about what you want to do with your own lives and careers, this is a good guidebook for where uh, things are ahead. And so these are the five areas, applying high throughput technology, translating basic sciences discoveries into new and better treatments, putting science to work for the benefit of healthcare reform, encouraging a greater focus on global health, and reinvigorating and empowering the biomedical research community. I think there's a reason that they're in this order, because it's actually through the first four that he's planning on doing the fifth. Or you could say, Business as usual is unlikely to be a successful strategy for an academic health system or those who are working in it. So this was sort of his theme slide, and having lived in San Francisco, I definitely appreciate this one. This is the Golden Gate, before the Golden Gate Bridge and after the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, again, referring to the theme of uh, the translational block. And this is uh, now happening um, as we're shifting the paradigm for therapeutics discovery. And this is a huge change that's occurring from a view that if we um, understood a few molecules and pathways, we could develop uh, successful products if we just did product development better. And what's really coming across now is that um, we need to sort of revamp the whole way we think about drug discovery and also technology development in the field of engineering. Now, this is an NIH slide. Um, I did not make this up. This is a Francis Collins slide. Tell me it doesn't look like our slide from seven years ago. This is what his plan is for the NIH. And you'll notice there's an NIH program for every element of this uh, translational uh, continuum. Now, I'll call your attention to the lower right-hand corner here. He doesn't say NIH. What he says is all of the above, which means that um, all of you should be thinking about which area you really can function best in, and feeling good about the fact that if you're cut out for industry, that's a great thing, not a bad thing, and that the bridges and divides across this continuum are going to be rapidly going away as we form these new partnerships. Part of this is increasing work with the FDA, and I would urge you to understand regulatory science better. Um, this has become a big issue as we're looking at um, the uh, items that we've been in the news about recently. We have a committee now hard at work on what the standards at Duke will be. And much of what we're concerned about is documentation that you can go back from a discovery and document that you actually had the data to justify the discovery that you said you had. No statement made here about honesty or veracity. It's a matter of documentation, which is a regulatory issue and increasingly will be an issue because this gap between discovery and application in humans is getting shorter. And people get a little picky when you say, I've got a discovery and it should be applied in human beings. A manifestation of this is what's called the Cures Acceleration Network. This is a program that Congress just passed. It essentially directs the NIH to become a drug development organization in the areas in which uh, industry is not doing a good job. The fun part of the discussion is you ask the question, where is industry doing a good job? And it's hard for people to come up with such areas right now because the failure rate is so high 
And even in the common diseases where we have a number of good drugs, we're now realizing that we need to segment those populations into multiple small populations defined on molecular characteristics who would have been considered orphan populations in the past. And so um, you'll notice this is going to have a big price tag, and it's going to change the way the NIH thinks to a much more deliverable-based organization. I would stress here, and it's part of the discussion, that no one is saying that the R01 pool is going to shrink, but no one is saying it's going to grow either. And so this is not at the expense of the current R01, but as you're thinking about where the new money is going to be, where the emphasis is going to be, it's really in this translational space. So again, you'll notice the Cures Acceleration Network is added on as part of this view of the continuum uh, at the NIH. Now, something for you to watch as you think about careers will be something called the Scientific Management Review Board. This is a new entity created by Congress a few years back to oversee uh, decisions made at the NIH from the point of view of good management. It has a minority of NIH people and a majority of external people. And they've just been um, asked by uh, Dr. Collins to come up with a report by December about how the NIH should reorganize to be more effective with regard to translational medicine. You'll see the mandate here. This is a pretty short time frame. And I would predict this is going to be a fairly major change that academic systems like ours will need to adapt to. And if you're adaptable, you'll be in great shape. Now, if you don't want to adapt for positive reasons, let me give you two negative reasons to adapt. <laughs> I think the reason to adapt is actually almost purely positive. The future is fantastic for you all. Um, it just won't be uh, configured the way it currently is. This is a look at purchasing power of NIH dollars over time. And if you draw a yellow line through uh, real dollars, you'll see it has not increased. Uh, actually, in 2011, we're going to be right where we were uh, in 2002. And you're all well aware with the price of technology that inflation for biomedical technology far surpasses inflation in the rest of society. So the real purchasing power here is pretty significantly down from where it was. There is almost no hope that this is going to increase at the NIH level over the next five years because of the dire circumstances of the federal budget. And the result is this. Um, this is essentially the success rate of R01 applications over time at the NIH. And you'll notice there is no uptick uh, in this slide. And the message here is that for people who are really, really good and at the top of their game, these are going to be the superstar all-stars. For the rest of us, we'd better become facile at being parts of translational teams in a variety of different places in society, not in the typical cocoons that have existed in academic health systems. And so you can think positively or neg negatively. I prefer to think positively. Um, and I'll come back to my original uh, opening slide. And then finally, um, someone probably smarter than us, I think, said it pretty well. I was reminded in this uh, day before yesterday on our external advisory committee call for our CTSA, Dr. Brownwall said, you know, a lot of people have forgotten what Darwin actually said. So this is actually what he said. It's not just the survival of the fittest, but he said in the struggle for survival, the fittest went out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. And I think that's the main message I'd like to leave you with. So I appreciate your uh, staying and paying attention. I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. No questions? I'm really disappointed. Uh, I yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, how you see the upcoming era of personalized medicine affecting the way that we do translational and clinical research. Uh, it seems that by focusing on smaller um, subsets of patient populations, I guess the downstream marketability and profitability is going to be smaller, and therefore potentially decrease uh, industry involvement. And so I was wondering um, whether, well, whether you can just comment on what you think that the translational and clinical environment will do to adapt to that. So I really don't see it that way at all. I actually think, um, yes, we will segment population. So the first message there is that um, we need a whole new science because like everything in life, we went through this uh, honeymoon phase where people pronounce, we'll do personalized medicine, we'll get these signatures, it'll all work. Well, guess what? Most of our signals are false positives. Most of it doesn't work, and it's going to be really hard work to sort out what's effective and what's not as we segment populations. But 
the bottom line, ultimately, for industry, this is going to be a boon because um, remember that people ultimately will pay for medical care and medicines if it provides a benefit. So to the extent that, a, that you can actually demonstrate that you provide a benefit in a segmented population, the profitability relative to the expense will actually go up. And we're, we're seeing evidence of that in cancer already, and I think as we do this in other fields, we'll see the same thing. So I don't, uh, this is the demise of industry with the blockbuster as we used to know it, but it's actually the um, renaissance of industry applied to human benefit as far as I'm concerned. But it really speaks to this whole thing. What we need are an army of people uh, understanding this very complicated biology and sorting through it applied to the human as the object of study. Yes? How do you think graduate education needs to change in order to prepare the researchers who are going to interact with patients? <coughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, I'm, I'm uh, as you can probably tell, I'm someone who looks at everything and says, I see a need for change, whether it really does or not. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, having one son is just a side, I have two sons who are aerospace engineers doing very well, making a great living. One has just decided to become a doctor, and the other is probably going to go back and get a PhD in physics. As I'm looking at the two, what I see in both cases are sort of ossified, old fashioned ways of doing things which don't really prepare people for what they're going to be doing to a large extent. Now, I'm not arguing for throwing out the fundamentals, which is that in the basic sciences, you should be good at your discipline and be able to conduct good experiments and research. And that's probably fine the way it is. But these other things I've talked about, they're out there, but, and I'll take a certain chair of responsibility, we haven't made it easy for, you know, I had no idea, for example, there were 800 postdocs at Duke. That's like an army of people. Well, I would say it's pretty hard for you 800 people to figure out exactly how to access all the opportunities we have. And if you all show up at Rose's office tomorrow, she probably won't be very <laughs> hot, happy, for example. So, but I think we've really got to, you know, America has a few things left where the rest of the world is envious of us. And I'm still a little shaken. I was over at Elon yesterday. Um, in a small group talking with Pervez Musharraf hearing uh, the Pakistani view of what the United States has done over the last 30 years. And uh, there are not a lot of things we're respected for now, but our universities are still held up to be the best. And I think if we get ossified and don't um, exert Darwinian favorable behavior, uh, other places have us in their sights and are trying to overcome us. So I think greater access to this sort of community orientation is probably the main difference. As far as medical schools go, just to put my word in that for the other son, um, I, I can't, I mean, what we've done in Singapore is what ought to be done. It's, if you haven't looked at that curriculum as a paradigm for how to educate in science, uh, just take a look at it. I guess that's all I'll say. Then the last thing, I get, may get in trouble for this, but as I look at the doctoral, postdoctoral system in the U.S. talking to my son who's going to go into physics. It's almost like you sign up to be an indentured servant for a period of time. Um, and I'm, I'm worried that in a lot of cases, the good of the student uh, or the doctoral student or postdoc is not the first thing in the mind of uh, the mentor. And I think we could do better in that kind of system. Okay, well, thanks for, uh, oh, you got another one? Yeah. For those of us who are not starting out looking at doctoral programs that are further along, what are the access points to some of the opportunities that you highlight, like the different institutes and units? Absolutely. You know, do, you, do you need further training after a postdoc to so, you know, consider integrating those? Or? Um, what I, I guess what I'd say about that is uh, we don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are 56 institutions around the U.S. doing this exper experiment. There'll be 60 at least by the time it's done. Everyone looks a little bit different, so if you think about moving into a future uh, where it doesn't matter where you live in the United States, there'll be a lot of different ways of getting there, and I would say the skills are probably more important than the degree, although I would not discount the value of having an advanced degree in terms of opening doors to do things. So. Uh, my, my advice, whether it's medicine or some other field, is, is always the same. Find something you love to do and get really good at it. And then find uh, the to get there, which may involve some combination of degrees or degrees plus other experiences 
to get where you want to be. So if you're interested in one of these five areas, find the uh, director, make an appointment, and force them to talk with you. That, that's what I would advise that you do. Okay, thanks everybody.